so thank you everyone again. And my talk is called, Yes, the FCC Might Ban Your Operating System, and the subtitle, But That's Not the Only Problem. Um, so first of all, who am I? Well, I'm, I'm Eric Schultz. I'm the um, community manager at Purple Foundation. Um, I'm also an open source advocate. I care about open source free software um, and the importance of people being able to um, modify software to, uh, to fit their needs and to, fit the, and, and to better, um, better fit their needs in their lives. So I care a lot about, about this. And this is part of the reason I have this job is, is because I care about open source and free software. Um, so I uh, have been brought into this topic related to the FCC's regulations of um, wireless radios. Um, and I've been uh, researching this on and off for since I think about November last year. Um, and it's really kind of picked up uh, related to um, a new FCC regulation or um, notice of proposed rulemaking. So I should start again and say I am not a lawyer and this is not legal advice. I find law interesting, but I'm not practicing it right now. So obviously, if you're going to make decisions based upon this, that's a bad idea. You should talk to your own lawyers. Um, that's much more important um, because I'm just that software developer who kind of likes to read law occasionally. Um, so, so there's been a, a notice of proposed rulemaking that is related to regulating um, wireless radios not just in routers, but in all kinds of devices. So I want to try to explain what the FCC does and why this is relevant, um, because it's, it's, uh, it's a very complex topic. There's a lot of pieces to it. So I kind of wanted to make sure that, that uh, everybody kind of had the base knowledge right. So what does the FCC do? They regulate the radio spectrum as, as a finite public resource. Um, the radio spectrum is finite. We don't have an um, unlimited amount. So the stuff we have has to be somehow um, split up between all the different uses. There's different classes of users, and they have different privileges. Um, for example, unlicensed users, which are what um, Wi-Fi, when you use Wi-Fi, you're considered an unlicensed user because you don't personally have a license. Um, you're allowed to do it, but you don't have a license. Uh, amateur radio operators who do have a license, broadcasters, and public safety personnel. And obviously, they have licenses as well. Uh, these privileges are related to modes of operation, power, and transmission frequencies. So this is, this is kind of relevant to one of the issues with the NPRM, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so what else do they do? They don't just regulate people. They regulate the devices. And they do it for reliability, safety, and compliance. The reason they do this is because let's imagine you had, you had a router. And normally, it runs at 1 watt. But all of a sudden, once in a while, it goes up to like 10 watts, or let's say a kilowatt, which was absolutely absurd. It would never work. But let's just say that it did that and just randomly did it. That would be very dangerous to the radio spectrum because you would have your Wi-Fi transmissions, they'd be going you know, like five miles, for example. And, that, and since there's only so many of these channels, like for example, with Wi-Fi, there's only approximately, uh, I think there's 14. Um, in the US, there's practically only 11 in one of the frequencies, I don't, in one of the bands, I don't remember uh, on the other one. But there aren't very many of them. So if everybody's went a really long ways, that would be very harmful because we would have these, like, these frequencies that were just filled with traffic, and nobody would actually be able to, uh, to you know, get any bandwidth from that because it would be so low. So uh, most consumer devices require equipment authorization, which simply means the FCC, they've gone through a procedure that the FCC um, does to regulate the devices and to, um, to understand uh, to make sure that, it, that it's, it's within the range that they expect it to be for various operating modes. Um, so one of the things that's important to this is understanding what a device is to the FCC. When I think of a device, I think of it's like it's either um, in like something like, a, like a, um, an operating system, it's like one little chunk of, you know, it's a, it's, you're, you're talking to your device driver, and that's one little thing in that it's basically self-contained. Or I think of it as, it's a router. This is my device. Uh, it's not quite like that in the FCC's mind. It's the hardware used for making radio transmissions, and also the software which can control the parameters of the transmission. And that's really important to understand. So it's not just the hardware. It includes anything that can control the hardware to operate in a, ma in a manner that is either um, that's regulated in some manner. 
So um, it's important now to understand how does the Linux kernel integrate with wireless radios? Because we have to understand how broadly um, understanding what a device is is relevant as to where the software actually is. Um, and for a lot of people, this is, this is going to be a uh, review. For other people, this may be new. So the, the kernel has a number of subsystems for managing wireless radio. Um, it has a wireless subsystem, which is obviously handling the wireless radio. It also has a regulatory subsystem, which basically handles the situation of, I am in the United States. I can use these channels. I can use this level of power. I can use this transmission mode. Um, if I'm in another place, I can use a different set of, set of those. Sometimes they can be higher, sometimes lower. Sometimes it's channels that can't be used in, they can be used in one, but not the other, or vice versa. Um, so it kind of handles that in a, it's an encrypted database, um, which, you, which if you wanted to create your own, you would have to go to the, you would have to download the source, you would have to go through a process of, of adding a new key. And it, it's not something you can easily do, just like accidentally. It's, it's kind of a difficult thing to do. It's not super difficult, but it's more difficult than uh, just you know, going to say OpenWRT and, and running make. It's, that's not gonna get you a different um, a different regulatory uh, domain and set of domain rules. You have the wireless radio driver, which uh, obviously, um, as we understand, it, it's in, you know, basically an API between the, uh, the operating system and the wireless firmware, which is, you know, actually operates that radio. So what, what logic is in there, it really depends. It depends on the particular driver. And then you have the, wire, then you have the actual wireless radio firmware which is the software that actually operates, um, operates the radio. Um, so what is the software that's included in a device? Um, it depends on the system, and it's not entirely clear based upon the way the FCC defines this. It almost certainly includes the firmware. Um, it probably includes the driver, but it depends on design, and it may include part of the kernel. And the FCC sees this really broad already because they currently have instructions for rules that are in place at this exact moment for UNII device applications. And UNII means Unlicensed National Information Infrastructure, which is their fancy term for five gigahertz Wi-Fi. Um, the applications require manufacturers to explain how they're banning the flashing of DDWRT. That's pretty important. If they have to explain how they're banning it, does that mean, doesn't that mean we can't in any way install a custom firmware? Uh, you know, not just, I'm not talking about the radio firmware, I'm talking about the entire operating system. Uh, so in the SCC's mind, this is a pretty broad range as to what they consider part of the device. So this is where we're to the MPRM. That has brought up a lot of discussion. We had, I had a blog post on this and did a, uh, we, our previous blog post, we only had a few hits a day, and then we had 30,000 one day. So that was a uh, little, little weird. We were, we were a little surprised by that, but it clearly has struck a nerve in people. Um, it's a notice of proposed rulemaking, and as it says, we think there should be a rule, and here's what changes we think should be made. What do you think? That's what the FCC is asking right now. They're basically, here's this rule. We think we're going to make this, but we're not sure. We have to justify it, and we're going to ask you what you think of it. And based on feedback, they can decide what changes, if any, they want to make. Um, chances are, if it's getting to an NPRM, they probably want to make changes. Um, and it's intentional. Um, so there's a couple problems with, with the, N, the NPRM. And I'm going to highlight them. And this is really long. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. But uh, one important part is, is that it says, um, let me look. Manufacturers must describe the methods used in the device to secure the software in their application for equipment authorization and must include a high-level operational description or flow di diagram. That part, part's not important. It's just they must secure the software. Additionally, it's, it says you have to define who is authorized to actually modify the software on the device. Now, remember, devices are, again, not as broadly. They're not the entire, entire router. But the problem is, is how do you actually secure, if it, we're going into the kernel, how do you secure the device without just locking everything down? Because practically, if, if, you, if you don't lock down the kernel, they can just you know, type a command and, and put something else in or rebuild the kernel and, 
and completely ignore all this software control. Um, so this is, this is a little bit more um, of the problem. And this has to do with certified modular transmitters. Modular transmitters are basically something you can take um, that you can basically get, get authorized as just the transmitter itself, put it into another device, and the new device doesn't have to be reauthorized. It, it's basically a way to reduce the burden upon device makers. Um, and this, is, this part of the, of the MPRM is really dealing with uh, particularly the certified modular transmitters. Um, so it says, manufacturers may use any means, including but not limited to the use of a private network that allows only authenticated users to download software, electronic signatures in software or coding in hardware that is decoded by software to verify that new software can be legally loaded into a device to meet these requirements. Um, so it, it's very clear that, that they do not want software installed that is, has not been approved by the manufacturer in some way ahead of time. Um, there may be a couple ways around this, but not very, they're not very good ways. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. So again, what's a modular transmitter? I, I explained that. It's just a piece of hardware that can be added without modifying, without having to recertify the device. Um, so why does this mean you can't install your own, own OS? And I kind of talked about this a little bit. It says, firmware is usually expecting the driver and kernel to help it make decisions, because that's how it's done right now. So that means the kernel is part of the device. And devices can't be modified by the user. So how do you prevent modification, modification to the kernel, which is part of the device, without banning the user from modifying the kernel in general? I mean, you're basically like, I have to ban modifying the kernel, because otherwise we're going to get into a situation where the user can modify the device in the mind of the FCC. So how do we know? Well, it's just my opinion, as well as lawyers from the EFF, FSF, developers from OpenWRT, SeroWRT, DDWRT, leaders from Qualcomm and Think Penguin, and a host of other people think this. And it's already being done right now for a separate set of rules, which is the um, 5 gigahertz UNII I talked about earlier. So one of the things is this does not only affect routers. And I think part of the reason that people have thought that that only affects routers is because a lot of the people, for example, Purple, were particularly interested in OpenWRT. And a lot of the other people who are interested um, feel that that's related, that they're involved in routers, router firmware, whatnot. So it's not routers. If it has a modular transmitter, regardless of use case, the rules affect it. Now, these are the, the proposed rules. Not the UNII rules, and I know that's really confusing because that only affects routers. But we can look at how that's implemented and what is expected of that to understand how this rule is implemented because they're very similarly written. So if this is in your computer, if this is in your phone, it's going to do the exact same thing. You cannot modify it in their mind. So there's a second part of this. It's called the E-Label Act which is the electronic label something something. It means something like every act of Congress that has an acronym that is pointless. Um, it's the E-Label Act. It basically says, you know those, those little FCC labels you get when you buy a router if you buy them in the US and then you just throw them away? Um, those things are actually required by law. They say that this has been certified in some manner. Um, FCC, the Congress decided um, I assume from under a suggestion of hardware manufacturers that you should be able to um, you should be able to just show this on the device somehow, so they don't have to then print a piece of paper and then deal with making sure it's in the box and all those kind of things. Um, in theory, it's not really a bad idea. It kind of makes sense, so we don't have to you know print print paper for no reason that people are just probably going to throw out anyway. Um, but the problem, too, is the E-Label Act implementation. And this is all part of the same MPRM. And I don't know why, because they're completely different topics. But apparently, the FCC felt that that was a very good way to organize it. Um, the necessary label information must be programmed by the, by the responsible party. It must be secured in such a manner that third parties cannot modify it. So we're starting to get back into our similar problem we just had. So the question is, what does this mean? And I can't exactly tell you. 
how broadly it's understood. Does this mean secure the display of the, of the label? Or does it mean just the label, just that the label info exists? For example, let's say that you have um, an Android phone. And it's in your, like, your system settings. You can go see the, the label. Um, how would they prevent you if you could flash the phone? How would, they, how would they make sure that that label info exists and can be shown to you as part of the system settings? That's really kind of difficult because there's really no way to, like, based upon how the code's written, to say, oh, it's going to show up, no doubt. There could be, it could crash, it, you know, you could have taken it out, any of these things. Um, but it's not clear if that's required. It's a, it's a bit of a vague rule. Um, and considering the requirement that they feel this is very important, I don't know if that's meaningful that, on how it's vague or if um, and we're reading too much into it, but we're not entirely sure. It could be that they just mean the label information exists. Like you put this, for example, like I said, in a write once ROM, as long as it's on the device somewhere and when you buy it, it's displayed somehow, as in it's in that system setting and it reads it from there, it could mean that as long as it's in that ROM, that's perfectly fine that you don't have to prevent it. I don't know because it's vague. Um, so like I said, how is this label information secured? Um, one way you could put it in is a write once ROM that you can't, it, that it's written, can't, can't take it out, it's there. Or could you put it on the main secure storage medium and then secure the whole medium? That's a way of doing it. In fact, I think that's actually probably more likely because you don't have to then put har extra hardware in your phone for no reason. Um, it's a possibility, I don't know. So blast the past, because now we have to talk about this current set of rules, um, which is in place. Um, and I know this is going to be really confusing because there's so many different rules, and I, this is why this is really difficult to explain. Um, again, there are rules for the UNII um, devices. And these are already in place in the United States. Um, and as of this year, new applications for devices have to meet these rules. And next year, devices that have previously been approved have to also meet these rules, which means they have to, I don't know if they have to be recertified, but they have to meet the rules in some fashion. And the rules are as follows. Um, the, a UNII device must contain security features to protect against modification of software by unauthorized parties. Um, and you can kind of go through that, that, um, those details. But as you see, it says, says, but manufacturers may use means including, but not limited to the use of a private network that allows only authenticated users to download software. Electronic signatures and software are coding and hardware that is decoded by software to verify that new software can be legally loaded onto a device to meet these requirements. That sounds really familiar because that's the exact same language they used in the, in the rules they're proposing. So we know how this rule has actually been implemented in practice. And I, I can't, well, I'll get to it in a second. There are also instructions for how the rules should be implemented. Apparently, there's a difference between rules and instructions. Instructions are created by an office in the FCC. They're basically to give, um, give the details. Like the rules are created by the FCC. They have some sort of um, broad, they tend to be kind of broader. But how do you actually implement this in practice? And as it says, an applicant must describe the overall security measures and systems that ensure that only authenticated software is loaded and operating the device, and the device is not easily modified to operate with RF parameters outside of the authorization. So it's important to note that this is not a rule. This is an instruction. And after the blog, my blog post came out, the FCC spokesperson said, well, it's just an instruction. Well, here's the thing is that every device maker is reading this to know whether they can comply with the rule. They have to meet this requirement. And there's a set of 18 questions that they have to answer on their application. So it's a little, little fuzzy to say, well, it's just an instruction. They don't, it's not the same as a rule. Well, it means the same practically. And this includes the infamous DDWRT callout, where they say, um, includes the question that says, what prevents third parties from loading non-US versions of the software firmware on the device? 
Describe in detail how, how the device is protected from flashing, it apparently needs to be in quotes, and the installation of third-party firmware such as DDWRT. That's pretty, pretty clear what they asked. Um, there's not a, not a whole lot of uh, wiggle room, I don't think, in that, in, that, in that phrase. So this is bad. It's really bad. This is really, really bad. I can't possibly explain because as written, this means that devices in most cases cannot be modified, um, particularly routers. This is really bad for any number of people. Um, and we'll talk a little bit up later about um, ways in which we can get around it and why it's still bad. So remember there's two separate, separate pieces, two separate rules. There's the NPRM, which is not, which is not uh, cons currently a rule of the FCC, it's just an idea. But there's also the UNII rules. And the UNII rules are really bad because they specifically call out that you have to prevent flashing, which is, that's horrible. Um, the reason that we're not arguing um, and advising the FCC on, on, on the UNII rules is that it's already a rule. That's really hard to, hard to, um, to affect because they've already gone through the process of asking for questions. And the truth is nobody really realized this was there um, until last year. Um, so we, uh, the reason we're, we're dealing with the NPRM is we need to explain that, that these rules are bad, they're gonna harm people, and that, we, um, that there's probably a better way to handle this. And if we can do that, and we can help the FCC understand this problem, um, that means that we could then address the UNII rules. So, oh yeah, it's not the US, US of A. Industry Canada, RSS 247 uses the almost the same language as the UNII rules. In the EU, I couldn't find the reference, but they are also doing the same thing, I know. I believe it applies in June of next year is when the rules need to go into effect. So is there a way to have some freedom and comply with the rules? Companies could modify software and hardware to support lockdown of the radio to the U.S. regulatory domain. Um, they, they maybe have, you could maybe have the firmware do everything and then just sign the firmware. Um, the problem is it's a little debatable. Like how, how much effort are companies in general going to do? The question is, like, are, do they find that the, that the free and open source um, market is big enough that they're willing to go redesign their hardware and then, and then then submit it and hope that it works and hope that they're going to actually get approved? Or is it more likely that they're just gonna lock the thing down and submit it and know it's going to get approved? As opposed to, like I had said, um, hope that it'll get approved when it's not completely locked down. And then if it's not approved, then, they're, then their competitors are to market first and then they're, then they're you know, missing, missing their, their windows and you know, all these problems. So the easiest thing to do is just simply lock it down. Um, in fact, I, I talked to one of the EFF lawyers and he said, he's like, if I was advising a company, I'd just lock it down. That's what I tell them to do. It's the easiest way to comply. It's the cheapest. And the question is, who does all this hurt? Well, even if, even if you say we're locking down the firmware, this is hurting people. This is going to hurt parts of the community. And these are the people it's going to hurt. It's going to, going to hurt researchers investigating how to improve radio performance. If you can't modify the way the, the radio functions, you can't, you can't investigate this. And this is from an FCC comment in reply to this NPRM. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, hurt service members, members of the military. Uh, one of, from an FCC comment, one of the gen there was a gentleman who said, I take my router between countries. I don't want to have to buy a new router in every country. It's, that would be way too expensive. I take my router with me, I change it to the, to the proper regulatory domain, and then I operate it within the rules of that country. Because the US rules don't cover everyone. It could be that you have it under US rules, you take it to another country and you're operating uh, outside of the law. So it's gonna hurt people like that that travel a lot, uh, service members. It's gonna hurt uh, amateur radio operators and disaster response personnel. And this, is pro this is actually probably really relevant. Um, 
some of you know a little bit about the mesh networking that, that, that gets done with OpenWRT um, and, and the experimentation. This is currently used by ham radio operators in the United States, and they work with disaster response personnel, and they use the mesh networking to um, operate uh, these large-scale um, internet access in, a, in an area where there's been, like, say, some sort of natural disaster, and they can actually have, you know, data networks that, that, are, that go across the area when there's no internet access there because everything's been destroyed effectively. Um, what's also relevant to this is they actually need to modify the firmware. The reason is that by law, they are allowed to operate on some of the same frequencies as, as unlicensed users, but they can operate at a higher power. And that's actually really relevant to, the, to their disaster response because they don't want to have to use as many routers. They can operate at, at, a, at this, you know, instead of one watt, they can do like 10 watts. And that actually really matters in a disaster response um, because you need to cover large amounts of area with, with, um, with transmission and data coverage. Potentially military, police, fire, and emergency personnel because some of these radios can actually be modified to go onto a frequency that is actually outside of what's authorized by the, for an, an unlicensed user. But um, military and police actually use a frequency that's just outside of, um, of what a average user, unlicensed user can use. So that's actually really important. So if the radio supports it, it's really helpful for them because they don't have to buy customized equipment. Software freedom advocates, obviously. And users, when the regulatory domains change. For example, regulatory domains have recently changed because previously part of the five gigahertz range was actually banned in the US. And this was recently changed as part of the UNII rules. This is all part of the same rule. But that means that, that the channels you can use actually have changed. So it really matters that you can update this. It's possible that, that the channel actually could get pulled out and say, no, you can't operate in this channel you previously were on. Well, the user could accidentally operate on there. And they're, they're actually financially liable to the FCC if you operate in a, in a manner that's outside of the, uh, your authorization. It, the punishment can be as high as like $20,000 per instance. It's extremely high. Um, when there's a problem in your firmware, you're legally responsible, but you can't fix it. So basically, I could find out that, that for whatever reason, the firmware is broken. It's operating illegally. My only choice is to turn off my device. I can't fix it. I can't get a, get a, cop, get a version from someone else that's fixed it because, I'm not, because it's been prevented. But I'm still legally responsible if I operate the device. So what do we do? Um, and I've been dealing with this uh, as part of, part of my organizing the summit and dealing with this. It's been a little bit of a, uh, little bit of a, uh, you know, a little too much work, but <laughs> um, it's a lot of stuff at once. Uh, we tell regulators that we need to be able to control our devices and give examples of how valuable this is. This is an incredibly valuable tool. The open WRT community is important. Um, the, the ability to modify firmware. We have examples of people fixing firmware and then submitting it back to the manufacturer because there was a problem with it. Um, the EFF launched a website um, earlier this week called DearFCC.org. They actually were originally using that uh, URL for um, net neutrality comments, but they have uh, graciously decided to modify it and allow comments related to this topic. So if you go there, it's a real simple form. You fill it out, explain what's going on, and you can, um, you can uh, tell the FCC you have some concerns. Um, we need to continue to be responsible in how we operate and not violate the rules. The problem, the, one of the reasons that the, that the FCC was concerned was that there were approximately 10 cases of people who were operating, um, it wasn't people, it was actually companies, um, they were operating these wide-scale networks, um, and they were turning off some important safety features, which is the dynamic frequency selection. Now, very few people have accidentally done this. You have to go through some effort to do it. Um, but these people were operating in a manner that was illegal, um, and they fined them a very significant amount of money. We need to be responsible and make sure that we're not doing that. And we need to consider how can we design our software so people don't accidentally do it. If somebody's breaking that rule, 
they should be intentionally doing it. There should be no accident, accident in that we're saying, well, you accidentally clicked the button, you turned it off, and, and oops. Like, this is important. There, there's, there's a reason these rules exist. So we need to obey these rules and, and create software in a way that discourages it from breaking it. We need to encourage regulators to collaborate with everyone on better rules and policies. These rules were in effect and they were not talked to about the community, they weren't talked to, as far as I know, manufacturers on a large scale before they proposed them. Um, this could have been dealt with if they had come to the community. So let's, let's encourage them to you know, bring in people, bring in um, you know, free and open source software advocates, proprietary developers, users, hardware vendors, third party firmware creators, everybody to actually talk about you know, is there a better way to come up with these rules that protect freedom better but also um, deal with the important needs that the regulators have. And we can consider, can, uh, consider voluntary self-regulation to prevent users. Again, to make sure that users aren't accidentally doing this. They have to be going through the process to make this happen. So we've had a co-signed comment um, as well between uh, OpenWRT, DDWRT, the Open Source Initiative, um, and Purple, and there's gonna be a few others possibly um, since the deadline is tomorrow, um, to actually just bring up the fact that, that regulators should come to, um, should deal with the community and actually talk about these, these concepts and whether they are, um, whether there are better ways to handle these rules. So I know it was a ton of stuff, so are there any questions? Right there. You mentioned the rules for modular radio devices. Mm -hmm. How does that affect something like your laptop, which has a USB port, which I might plug the USB radio into? Good question. Don't know. And how, how does that on your laptop affect it? Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, most laptops have, have little Wi-Fi modules inside like of the little mini PCI slot. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think they should be forced to make this absolutely completely um, consistent throughout. Once they, once they pass this rule, all software is frozen. Anything with a radio in it. <laughs> that is possibly a way that they may implement that. Um. And, then we let, and then we let Microsoft fight our viral battle for us. <laughs> I don't think that'll go well. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, the, the obvious way to do it is, like you said, is uh, to lock down uh, more like the... the radio chip firmware, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps for is that to be signed, um, it seems entirely obvious. Um, why didn't the FCC go that way? Why did they uh, make it such a broad target? That, that, that seems uh, I, strange. I don't think they actually, if you ask them, I think they would probably say that that is probably how you should implement it, if I had to guess. The issue is that they don't like to give technical explanations of like, you should implement it X number of ways because they want, want to have people to have some level of variety. So um, they would probably say that that's probably a very good way to do it. Um, the problem is that our software and hardware are not designed to do that at this second, which is part of the problem, is that if you did design it, it could do that. Um, you would still lose a lot of valuable, as I explained, you know, a lot of valuable use cases that should probably be protected, um, but that would reduce the harm at the very least so that we could obviously modify our operating systems, which is pretty important. Um, so right back there. Yeah, you were asking about the EU um, mm -hmm. legislation. I found it. It's um, 2014-53. Um, I'm not going to read mm -hmm. it here, of course. <laughs> and I only briefly skimmed it, but it uh, sounds a bit less intense. Um, because in the reasoning, there's always the reasoning made in the beginning, and mm -hmm. then the rules follow. And in the reasoning, it says, um, the user of the radio equipment or third party should only be able to load software into the radio equipment where this does not compromise the subsequent compliance, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But then later on it also says, verification by radio equipment of the compliance of its combination with software should not be abused in order to prevent its use with software provided by independent parties. So it sounds a bit weakened. I, I heard that, th that they did that. I'm not exactly sure how you do both. Yeah, yeah and, and also it's a little I'm a in little the skeptical. rules later on, I don't find any sign of, of how they're going to really control it. So.
So indirectly, it also means that basically inside the European Union, you won't be able to sell a device that you actually completely lock down. Because this, this rule doesn't be abused in this way. I'm not sure you comply with both, with both cases, but that should be a fun, fun case for hardware manufacturers. <laughs> So as far as I know, in the wireless communication chips, there's already a regulatory restriction in there in the in the device itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a as a manufacturer, as a device vendor, we can purchase these chips unlocked for for global uh, for global purposes. Mm -hmm. And one way to solve this problem would might uh, would maybe be, be to if the customer requests to upload his own firmware then he has to specify a country to lock it in the hardware. We would then do the hardware lock and then release the software lock. It, this might be a possible That's way. That's a way to do it, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I uh, actually found out about this uh, about a week ago before I mm -hmm. left. Um, and uh, at the time, I actually did submit a comment and at the time, the deadline was the day after I was about to do it. So they had been extending this deadline. They had already extended it once. So I'm, uh, yes. I'm, I'm thinking that they are getting some pushback and beginning to perhaps rethink things a little bit. It's, that's a, I think that's a hopeful sign. I think that I would like that to be a case. I have reason to believe that, the, um, that this is coming probably from very high up on the commission that likes it this way. And I'm not sure that that will that we're going to be able to actually have much effect, but I'm hoping. So um, the extension is is it is uh, is heartening certainly. Yes, they they this has been something they felt was necessary. Sorry. A question, maybe also a suggestion. Mm -hmm. uh, something similar happened two three years ago when Apple really tried to lobby the government to lock down the iPhones. Mm -hmm. And it was obviously intended to prevent jailbreaking. They couldn't make it, didn't pass. So perhaps there are some parallels there that can be leveraged and more probably for legal people than technical ones. But uh, it's yeah. legal to jailbreak an iPhone, so yes. I, which means replacing the software in there. So I don't see why that shouldn't apply in the end from, from a pure logical reason, mm -hmm. right? So, whether whether law follows logic, I don't know. And the other thing is that it's very it's very important to understand it isn't actually banning a user from doing it under penalty of law. It's requiring the manufacturer to make it nearly impossible for the user to do it. So the user can still do it if they can figure out a way around it. But Apple can sell phones that can be broken. Yes. Yes, they can. In case the manufacturers they can require passwords and then they can leak out if they comply with the rules. I'm not going to recommend ways around it. I don't know if this is a naive question. Um, do you know if there's any uh, data behind this decision? Like, uh, have they been seeing an excess number of people operating devices outside the spectrum? No. I mean, they had 10 of them. They had, there were 10 of them in, I think, since 2005. But they, they have punished people for it, and they were operating unsafely, and they were doing it near airports, which was dangerous. But the problem is, this is a, this is a really small number, and a really broad rule for a really small number that could probably be better dealt with just simply finding the people that are doing this and punishing them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's people. Uh, there. I, I was just saying a lot of people are probably operating their devices in Europe using the US default settings. That's probably there, one of the worst offenders. One, one of the things that was relevant about this is that the particular firmware that they were using, it allowed you to click a button to turn off the dynamic frequency selection, which is the setting that was, um, that was actually causing the problem. Um, and that's part of my self-regulation. We should not be releasing firmware that does that. that, that that's absolutely un unacceptable and absolutely irresponsible. There's no excuse for that, that you should be turning off um, the regulatory basically from, from a checkbox. It's idiotic, honestly. 
um, it, it shouldn't be done that way. You, you should have to go through some effort to actually do that if you want to. And that's going to discourage, I would say, you know, like 99.9% .9 of people. Is that why they call out the DDWRP? Did it have a button like that? Is that what happened? Or? You can guess which one it is. So. And an anecdote related to the US versus EU comment. I've got an NVIDIA Shield tablet. It's got a 4G modem in it. And it's running CyanogenMod. Um, but I am unable to change it from the US frequencies to the EU frequencies. Yep. However, it is the exact same hardware. It's just the firmware. Yep. When NVIDIA built this, they very intentionally gave users the ability to install CyanogenMod mm -hmm. and other Android mods on it. But the firmware is signed, and it's done as far as we can tell so far, in a bulletproof way so that we can't change the regulation from one place to another. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it kind of at the same time highlights, yes, there will still potentially still be some flexibility in, in the OS, but there are also some problems. For example, right now I'm running in US mode and shh, don't tell anybody by maybe breaking laws. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's part of the silliness of this is that it's, they very clearly regulate things based upon a very certain set of, of assumptions that I don't think are really valid anymore. Like people are global, people go places. Um, they would say that amateur radio operators have a right to have a device that's modifiable because they're the people that are allowed to basically tinker. Well, I actually think that everybody is allowed to tinker and that should include people that are, um, that are, have a, what they call a part 15 device, which is, an, uh, which is for unlicensed users, like a, like a router. Like that, that set of people is not as clear as I think in their minds they think it is, and that's actually causing some problems. And that's, I think, where this is all coming from, is their view of the world is different than how a lot of other people would view it. Yeah, to the last person who asked that, that question. I'm not sure if that's true. I had a Cyanogen OS on my phone as well. And uh, in a previous version, I could set the, the, the location, the regulatory location. In the current one, I can't. Uh, what I think happens, though, is that they're using GPS and, uh, and wireless ranging to, to figure out where you physically are. It's not on this device. So my, a really good friend of mine is actually the one that built the Cyanogen mod support for this device. And he's been in contact with NVIDIA. There was actually an NVIDIA engineer that sent him an email back and said, you're right, I can't even do this on my device. It's like <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the, so the question I wanted to ask actually is, when the regulatory database infrastructure was uh, implemented in, in Mac 802.11 mm -hmm. a few years ago, I seem to recall from the, the, the way things were worded on, on wireless.kernel.org was that they had actually worked with regulators to- They did. So what happened between then, when there was actually an active col collaboration, and now? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I, um, I, know, uh, I know one of the people that had organized that a lot was Bradley Kuhn from uh, S Software Freedom Conservancy. And I think um, his, his, his point is he said, well, I thought we protected it for free software, and I've been focusing on other things. And all of a sudden, they weren't collaborating. Um, and, and the way the, the regulatory database, in my understanding, works is that you can, once the device is started, you can't modify um, to gain additional, like, like they basically do a, an intersection between the current rules and the rules that have been selected. Um, and you can't ever do anything that will, will have you something higher and that you, you go, you cover more frequencies or a higher power, it's only lower once the device is started. And that's my understanding of it. It's, it's a little confusing, but they actually designed it in that sense of self-regulating. So people aren't accidentally doing this. You have to like, re, you have to you know, modify the files, restart your device. You have to go through some effort to actually get this to actually work. You, in some cases, you have to rebuild the kernel, um, depending on how, it, how it's done, is my understanding. So. That's my understanding, could be wrong, but um, right. I, yeah, I think you have to rebuild the kernel to actually do that. Um, I think that there's another funny thing about it. There was once a standard, which is 802.11d, which was something called world mode. Mm -hmm. I think it's already banned now in the US, but 
one of the one of the funny things about it is that some vendors implemented it this way this they they were scanning like mm -hmm. wi-fi networks and see which uh, country code was announced by most of the ap's around and based on that dynamically switch yep. to regulatory domains which is also kind of a funny approach yeah. and i think it's now banned by the fcc as well yes. since this year but they like yeah, yeah, I actually had saw that and they originally that was like supposed to be the solution to this and the FCC says, well, you can't trust the you can't trust the routers, so that's not good enough. So I was around uh, Qualcomm Atheros when Lu Luis Rodriguez was there and did some of the work on CRDA and it was it was meant uh, initially it was thought of as a client issue and mm -hmm. the domain was was dealt with and that's why I think routers kind of slip through the cracks. And uh, there wasn't something to deal with DFS. And, and I think the main problem they have is they don't want um, ubiquitously available, easy to grab, you know, source, or, or I mean, compiled binaries that any, anyone can just reflash their router with available that will disable, allow you to disable DFS and all those other things. So the CRDA does have a signed package, but the problem with routers was that they are, I think, distributed around, and so the only way developers could get around this was disabling that CRDA that was really intentionally designed for PCs first, mm -hmm. and the routers didn't quite fit. And so we're still struggling with that fact of how do you know what domain you're in, how are you able to change it in legitimate ways but not change it when it's not legitimate. And mm -hmm. that's still the tricky part where, you know, Imri and some others have some ideas of what you should put in a signed package. But there is a signed kernel package Seth Forshi um, maintains now the regulatory domain database. Mm -hmm. So he signs that package and I think there just has to be more complexity on top of that. Yeah, I, I think I think that's at I, I think that that like I said, like self regulation so people are not easily just downloading a pat downloading um, a binary and just flashing it and they're done. I mean I think this this should be a little more difficult. It shouldn't be like that for if people want to break the rules, they should have to actually intend to break the rules and let's avoid this accidental. And I think that that would cover, you know, like I said, 99.9% .9 of these problems and these are really rare to start off with, so. In regards to intention for breaking rules, I think that device start is a poor indicator of a change. I ask for the room, how many people put your device in airplane mode last time you were in an airport? Airplane, airplane. I don't know. Now, how many of those devices in airplane mode restarted? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm, I'll be happy to talk about this more later. Um, you know, please give your comments at, at um, dearfcc.org and. Uh, you know, basically share your opinion politely. By tomorrow. by tomorrow, yes, you have to do it by tomorrow. What's that? Do it today. Do it today, absolutely. Do it, do it, do it during Cesare's talk, is what I'm saying. Do it during Cesare's. <laughs> Just find a time. Okay. You can. That you can do it whether they're going to pay as much attention, I don't know. But I, I should mention that this is obviously relevant to everyone because, I mean, the U.S. is such a large market that if they have to start locking them down in the U.S., there's a chance that that's just going to spread anyway, whether the regulations change or not. Because it's just, it's just simpler for manufacturing. For those of you who wish to comment who do not have a New York address, uh, the Postal Service operates a general address. <laughs> general delivery, New York, New York, 10010. And that is absolutely valid for anyone in the world. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone.